Hello students, Dr. Lyons here. Uh, and in this chapter, we're going to start to get into ecology. So the, the last three chapters uh, that we'll cover in, the, in, the, in this class are the ecology chapters. So first we're going to do kind of an intro to what ecology is. Uh, then in the next chapter, we're going to talk uh, a little bit more about population ecology, and then we'll talk about community ecology uh, at the very end. So in this chapter, we'll be doing just kind of a basic intro to what ecology is. So ecology is, is the, uh, the study of any sort of interactions uh, among or between living things. Right, so ecology technically is the study of interactions between organisms, so any living thing, you know, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, etc., uh, including us, uh, and the environment that is around them. So that can be the, the living things in the environment around them, or it can be the non-living things in the environment around them. So what you see going on here is one of my favorite types of interactions uh, amongst living things. Uh, so the, the research that I did for my PhD dissertation was on these two critters that you see here. Uh, and my PhD dissertation was largely on ecology. Uh, and what goes on between these two things right here is down here we have a shrimp and up here we have a fish that's known as a goby. Uh, and the shrimp is blind, but it can make these holes in the sand. So behind this shrimp, there's this really deep network of caves underground. Uh, and that shrimp has built that network of caves and that's what it used to have, that's what it uses to avoid predators. However, sometimes it needs to come out of this little hole in order to eat or to push sand from inside the, the, the caves to the outside. So, but when it does so, it's in danger because it's blind and it can't see predators above, you know, up, up that might be coming towards it. So that's where this fish comes into play. So this fish has these big eyes, so it can see predators coming. However, it's not very good at making this network of caves underneath the ground because it doesn't have claws like this shrimp does. So what goes on here is what's known as a mutualism, where this shrimp, uh, it makes a home for the goby, and the goby in return gives a warning signal to the shrimp to tell the shrimp when it should go into the hole and when it's safe to come out of the hole. So what you'll see happening is the fish will just sit at the entrance of the, the cave, you know, all day long. Uh, and essentially, any time the shrimp comes out, it puts its little antenna on the back of the fish. Uh, and it'll only come out if the fish essentially lets it know that it is safe to come out. So they're exchanging basically a set of eyes and a, and a lookout for a, a, a shelter that they can both live inside. So both the shrimp and the fish, they live inside of this burrow together. Uh, and so that's an interaction between living things. Uh, and so when I was studying these species and studying how they interact with each other, I was essentially doing ecology research. So uh, ecology, as I was saying, is about things that are that are interacting with their environment. And there's kind of two different flavors of what we find in the environment around us. So there is the biotic uh, and there is the abiotic. Right. So by now, you already know that bio means life. Uh, and you should also already know by now that if we put the letter A in front of any word, it means to not have that thing. So biotic are the living things in the environment around an organism, and abiotic means the non-living things in the environment around them. Right, so the biotic things that are, in, that are in the environment around another living thing is pretty obvious. So say, for instance, we're talking about this fish right here. So this, this is what's known as a schoolmaster snapper. So the, the biotic things around it includes like this sea fan, it includes this gorgonian coral, it includes algae that's on the seafloor, and it includes all the small crabs and lobsters and such that is on the seafloor that the snapper might eat. And it includes these people swimming by, and it includes the plankton that's in the water around them. Right, so all living things that are around this snapper uh, are, are part of the biotic environment around it. So now let's talk a little bit about some of the abiotic things that might be around a living thing. So first of all, energy is a really important abiotic factor around living things. You know, because all living things need energy in order to function, right? So you need energy to listen to this lecture right now. I need energy to talk into my computer to record this lecture, right? We all need energy. 
Uh, and so the, the energy source that we all use is essentially the sun, right? So sun, uh, the sun, you know, it, there's energy being emanated from the sun, uh, you know, in the form of light that is, that is coming to earth. Uh, and that light energy is then used by plants to make sugars that have stored energy. Uh, and then all of us animals then go along and eat those plants or eat animals that eat those plants. So the, the energy source that we use is the sun. Uh, and so where is that energy source uh, the most concentrated? Uh, so of course, it's the most concentrated around the equator, right? Wherever you would get the worst sunburn, right? That is where that energy source is the most highly concentrated, uh, which in a large part is why you find, tend to find a lot more life around the equator than you do at the poles, you know, because there's a lot more energy there. Uh, also, of course, it's, you know, a lot warmer there near the, near the equator than by the poles, but there's a lot more energy coming in there as well. So energy is really important. Uh, temperature, that's a really important abiotic factor, right? Because temperature affects our metabolism. So it affects the rate that chemical reactions go on inside of our bodies. Uh, and, and the basis of how this works is that there's a positive correlation, meaning that the warmer you are inside, the faster your metabolism is going. However, there are limits to that, right? So for most organisms, uh, if their internal temperature gets down to zero degrees centigrade, so 32 degrees Fahrenheit, their metabolism completely stops, right? And then, and then they basically freeze to death. Uh, and, and also for many organisms at 45 degrees centigrade, which is about 115 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, that's when enzymes are destroyed. So enzymes, those were those types of proteins that help chemical reactions take place. Uh, so most living things are going to have internal temperatures that are between these two points, between 0 C and 45 degrees C, uh, because of the metabolism. So temperature is really important. Uh, and temperature has a very big effect on where things are found, right? You need to live someplace where, where your, your body can deal with those temperatures. Water is, of course, a really important abiotic factor. Right, as many of you know, a huge amount of our mass is water. Something like 70% of our total weight is in water. Uh, and why we need so much water is because it's a medium for our cells. Right, so our cells like being, you know, submerged within a watery environment. Uh, and why this is really good for them uh, is because of diffusion and of, and of osmosis. So those things we talked about way back in, in chapter five. Right. We learned about how particles will dissolve across membranes going from high concentration to low concentration. Uh, and that is a lot of how our cells are able to get the materials that they need. However, that only works if our cells are watery inside and there's water on the outside of them. So water is really a very crucial thing for, for, uh, for living things. So it's a very important abiotic factor. Uh, and as we know, water does have a big effect on where things live. Right. The reason why there's so many more plants living, you know, in tropical rainforests as opposed to deserts, uh, a lot of that is because there's just way more water in tropical rainforests than there are in deserts. OK, so some nutrients are, of course, really important abiotic factors. Right. So by nutrients, I'm talking about things like nitrogen. Uh, that's really important for our amino acids and our nucleic acids. Right? So without nitrogen, we wouldn't be able to make proteins and we wouldn't be able to make our DNA and RNA. Right? So that's a really important uh, nutrient. Of course, oxygen and carbon dioxide are very important abiotic factors. Right? So we need oxygen for cellular respiration. Plants need carbon dioxide to, to do photosynthesis. Right? So we all need these things. Uh, and as I was kind of mentioning before, uh, things like temperature and, and rainfall and oxygen and all of those various abiotic factors, they can have a really big effect on where you find things living and, and where um, species are distrib uh, distributed. So what this is showing is amphibian diversity on a global scale. Uh, and so any, uh, any places that are white means that there are no amphibians living there. Any places that are blue means that there are very few. Uh, and then as you go from blue to green to yellow to orange to red, you're getting more and more species. So red means lots and lots of amphibians. White means none. Blue means very few. Uh, and so when we look at this, uh, this graph, there should be a couple of things that, that jump out to you. 
right? So first of all, there's kind of areas where there's lots of amphibians. So so in places like um, like Brazil, so you know, so in northern part of South America, in the southeast of the United States, uh, in equatorial uh, Africa, uh, and then through parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, so there's there's a, there's two really important things that unify these areas, right? So the first one that you're probably all thinking of is water, right? So these are really wet areas, right? So so like the Amazon rainforest is very very wet. Uh, another thing that, that these places have in common is that they're really, really warm, right? So, so the Amazon, really warm, equatorial Africa, really warm, the southeast of the United States, very warm, Southeast Asia, very, very warm, right? So these are all wet and warm places. Uh, and now you can see some places on there that are either wet or very warm, uh, but they don't have many, many amphibians. So for instance, in Northern Africa, you don't see any amphibians even though Northern Africa is really, really very warm, but you don't see any amphibians there because they're deserts. It's very, very dry there. Uh, and alternatively, in like the Pacific Northwest, so, so places like, like Washington and in uh, and British Columbia uh, and parts of Canada, you know, it, it's very, very wet there, but you don't see a lot of amphibians because it's just too cold for them to live there. So uh, the amount of rainfall uh, in, the, in the temperature has a really big effect on where you find things living. So abiotic factors are really, really important to living things. Okay, I did want to kind of tie this in with what we talked about back in, in chapter 13. So ecology and evolution are really quite important to each other uh, because ecology uh, is kind of tells us a little bit about natural selection. So how it kind of works is that organisms evolve, so they adapt. Uh, and why they adapt uh, is a result of natural selection, right? We learned about how natural selection is, is this process by which organisms that have the, the best traits are the ones that are more likely to survive and have offspring. Whereas organisms that have really shitty traits, they are the ones that are not gonna survive. So they don't survive and they don't have any offspring. And over time, a population will shift towards there being more and more individuals that have those really, really good traits and fewer and fewer individuals that have those really, really crappy traits. Right. So natural section is one of the ways that, that organisms evolve. Uh, and a lot of the selective pressures that are on animals and plants is owing to the interactions that they have with the environment around them, which then gets at ecology, right? Because ecology is all about interactions between living things and the environment around them. So for instance, when we look at this fish, so this is what's known as a great barracuda, right? We can see that it has, uh, that it, it has adapted certain traits uh, that are related to how it interacts with things in the environment. Uh, probably the clearest example of that is the big teeth that it has, right? So those teeth are adaptations that this barracuda has evolved uh, in order to deal with the environment around it, specifically in order to catch prey, right? So these teeth have been evolved for that specific purpose, for helping this barracuda uh, with its ecology, with the, the, the environment that it has around it. Right, so ecology and evolution are, are really very much tied to each other uh, because ecology will often tell us what are the selective pressures that are on an animal or a plant. Right? In the case of the barracuda, a very important selective pressure is to be able to eat. Uh, and so if this barracuda has really crappy teeth and it makes it hard for it to catch its prey, you know, it's not going to survive. It's not going to do so very well. So ecology has a really big effect on evolution and then vice versa. Uh, because when things evolve better, better traits, then they do better with interacting with things in the environment around them. Uh, they kind of do better with, with ecology, essentially. So that's how ecology and evolution kind of kind of fit in with each other. So let's talk a little bit more about how things adapt to the environment kind of within one lifetime. So of course, things can evolve uh, uh, adaptations over many, many generations that make them better at dealing with their environment. But there is some capacity of living organisms to adapt to the environment within their lifetime. So, for instance, one way that, that, that animals and plants can adapt is through what's known as a physiological response. So this is when uh, an animal or plant or, or any living thing for that matter 
can acclimate, you know, within a limited range of conditions, right? So for instance, you could think of this as, as like shivering or sweating, right? So we, we have a, a you know, a, a preferred temperature, probably somewhere around say 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but if it gets too hot, then essentially you start to sweat. Uh, and that is your body's way of cooling itself down. Or if you get too cold, you start to you start to shiver, and uh, and your in your in the blood vessels at your skin start to contract, kind of kind of keeping blood towards the center of your body, right? So that's a physiological response where your body is adapting or acclimating to to different temperatures, but that only of course works in a limited range, right? If if you know if it's 150 degrees outside, no matter how much you sweat, you just cannot persist in that. You know, and if it's, you know, you know, 20 degrees below freezing, you know, no matter how much you shrip, you shiver and how much your, your capillaries, you know, vasoconstrict, you're never going to be able to survive in, in that condition. Uh, and so why I chose this picture here uh, is, is, first of all, this is not me. So I've never climbed Mount Everest like this crazy person. Uh, but something that, that people do when they are doing big climbs like this is they will stop uh, at certain levels on the way up to the summit. And why they're doing that is they are allowing their bodies to make a physiological response. Uh, and the type of response that they're doing is getting their bodies used to lesser and lesser amounts of oxygen in the air. Because uh, as a lot of you know, the higher up you go, the, the thinner the air is. Uh, there's essentially, it's essentially harder to breathe up there because there's less oxygen uh, concentration in that air. So what climbers will do is they will they will work their way up gradually, uh, allowing their bodies to get more and more used to the lower and lower amounts of oxygen. Uh, so so that's why this guy is able to stand on the top of Mount Everest right now and, and breathe that air up there. However, if you did take just one of us that are adapted to being at sea level uh, and just instantly put us on the top of Mount Everest, we would not be able to breathe. Uh, because our bodies would just not be used to that low amount of oxygen. Uh, one has to acclimate to that. So that's a physiological response. An anatomical response is when you actually change around your anatomy, your, your, your morphology, kind of your appearance. Uh, and so that's what you see here. Uh, so you see uh, uh, this is what's known as an arctic uh, fox. So this is what it looks like in the summertime, and this is what it looks like in the wintertime. Uh, and I think probably, you know, why this thing changes between summer and winter is pretty obvious. You know, it has to do with camouflage. It has to do with the thickness of the coat. Probably a lot of you have even noticed this uh, amongst your dogs and cats. You know, so during the summertime, they'll be shedding a lot more because they need less fur. In the wintertime, they don't shed nearly as much. So that's an anatomical response. So changing around uh, your anatomy to acclimate to the environment. Uh, and then finally, there's behavioral responses. Uh, so if you can't, you know, respond physiologically, if you can't change around your anatomy, you know, what you might do is just move to where the conditions are best for you. Uh, and so there's a huge number of animals that migrate, that, that move to where conditions are better for them. Uh, and that's what you see here. So you see a bunch of, uh, I guess these are cranes that are moving north or south. Right. so a lot of birds, they will spend their summer times up in the high Arctic. Uh, you know, up in places like Canada and Russia and, and, and Alaska. Uh, and then in the wintertime, they, they go down to warmer climates around the equator in Central and South America. So that's a behavioral response. Okay, so that's a little bit of an intro to, to ecology, to the, the study of interactions between living things and the environment around them. Uh, and so we focused a lot on, on abiotic factors. Uh, when we're talking about living things uh, in their interactions. So what I want to do now is we're going to talk about the various biomes that we have in Southern California uh, and what sort of adaptations uh, living things would need to deal with those particular biomes. Uh, and first of all, what a biome is, is essentially just a large light, a large area that is characterized by certain type of types of life and vegetation and physical characteristics in that that area. Uh, kind of another word for biomes are ecosystems. Uh, those two things are, are pretty much uh, synonymous with each other. So first we'll, we'll go through some of the watery biomes. Uh, and so first we'll go over freshwater, right? So freshwater uh, biomes cover very little of the Earth's surface, so less than 1% of the Earth's surface. 
But of course, these are really, really important to us humans for a few, you know, for a few pretty obvious reasons, right? So, so we use fresh water for generating electricity. So hydroelectric dams that, that generate electricity using the movement of water. Uh, irrigation is, of course, really important. So we need water to feed to, you know, to plants and to animals that we grow for consumption. Of course, drinking water, very, very important. Uh, we need fresh water for transporting things, right? So a lot of goods and materials are transported along fresh water. Uh, of course, there's a lot of things come out of freshwater biomes that we eat. Uh, and of course, we oftentimes recreate, you know, in and around freshwater bodies. So like this is, for instance, is what's known as Alpine Lake. So a lake in very high uh, altitude. Uh, and this is a nice place for me or for anybody else that wants to go there to go recreate around. So some of the, the freshwater biomes that we have in Southern California, you know, include lakes and ponds. So these are, are standing pools of, of water, right? So that's like what you see here. Uh, this isn't actually a, a, a lake in Southern California. This is what's known as Crater Lake, which is up in Oregon. Uh, but anyway, it's a standing pool of water. Whereas water that is moving, these are, these are what we know as rivers and streams. Uh, so in these pictures, these are rivers where there's water that is flowing out towards the ocean. Uh, and then finally, we have wetlands where we have a transition from either a freshwater biome uh, or an oceanic biome uh, to, to the land. Right. So these are places where we have a transition from, from water to land. So like what you see here, this is what's known as a marsh. Uh, so marshes, bogs, swamps, these are all what are known as, as wetlands. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the, the freshwater uh, ways in Los Angeles uh, uh, County. Uh, and there's kind of two major what are known as watersheds in LA. So there's the Los Angeles River Watershed and there's the San Gabriel River Watershed. Uh, and what a watershed is, is it is a area where all of the rainfall or snowfall uh, will go into one particular river and make its way out to the ocean. So we have two major rivers that are in LA. So we have the Los Angeles River and the San Gabriel River. Uh, and so the Los Angeles River kind of starts over in the, the, the hills kind of to the, uh, to the, the west of the valley. Uh, and then LA River runs, you know, kind of north of the 101 through Balboa Park, you know, underneath the 405 and the 101 past our, our school, right? So Los Angeles Valley College is right there. Kind of runs past Griffith Park, you know, down past uh, downtown LA, uh, and then eventually snakes its way along the 710 down to Long Beach, where it then goes into this bay, which is known as San Pedro Bay. So essentially any, any area, you know, within this watershed here, if rain falls here, it's going to eventually end up in the LA River and go out towards the ocean. So most of us live in the LA River watershed, right? So when rainfall hits the, the ground, you know, in the areas where we live, it's going to eventually end up in the LA River and then make its way out into San Pedro Bay. So over kind of on the eastern side of LA, uh, there's the San Gabriel River. So the San Gabriel River starts up in the San Gabriel Mountains, and then it makes its way south, uh, you know, past downtown, uh, where it merges with uh, the LA River uh, here, right under the 710 Highway. Uh, and then it, it keeps moving south and south until it, you know, goes into San Pedro Bay. So all of this area here, anytime rainfall, you know, hits the ground there, it's going to go into the San Gabriel River and make its way out into the uh, into the ocean. So those are our two major rivers and two major watersheds uh, within Los Angeles. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about some ocean biomes. So oceans cover a lot more of the earth. Uh, in fact, 71% of the earth is covered by ocean, right? That's why our planet is often referred to as a blue planet because most of it is covered with water. Uh, the oceans are, of course, very important to us humans for a number of reasons, right? So first of all, we get a lot of food and other products such as pharmaceuticals from the ocean, right? So a huge number of people on the planet rely on the ocean for their main source of protein, you know, from eating things like fish and, and shellfish. Uh, a lot of the oxygen that we breathe is coming from the ocean. 
Uh, in fact, roughly 50% of the oxygen in the atmosphere comes from microscopic plants that live in the ocean, right? So we very much rely on the ocean for our oxygen. Uh, we use the ocean for transportation, right? If you were to look at uh, any of the, the, the tags uh, on the clothes that you're wearing right now, you would find that, you know, a lot of the things that we wear and a lot of the products we consume are coming from overseas. And how that stuff is getting here, getting to Los Angeles, for the most part, is in large barges, uh, large uh, tankers that, that, move the, that move across the ocean. Of course, the ocean is useful for recreation. Like you see, here's my wife scuba diving around a coral reef, recreating. Uh, drinking water does often also come from, uh, from the ocean. Uh, so in particularly in places where there's not really reliable sources of fresh water, uh, oftentimes ocean water will be desalinated. So there's a process by which you can remove the salt from the ocean uh, and, and then you can use that, that ocean water as drinking water. Uh, the kind of downside of that is that, re is that it requires a huge, huge, huge amount of energy to do that. Uh, which is why uh, it's not done in many places. It's, it's, it's really only done in places where there's very unreliable uh, sources of fresh water. So for instance, there's a, an, an island that, that, that I lived on with my wife for, for a few years, uh, and that island was so small that there really wasn't any fresh water uh, on it. So all of the water that people would drink on, on that island all, all was desalinated water, so water from the ocean. You know, but here in LA, you know, we might not have the best sources of water, you know, but we do have fresh water nearby, uh, which is why there's not really desalinization going on in, in Southern California. Finally, another reason why, uh, why water, why, why the ocean is really important to us is that it regulates the climate, right? So oceans can absorb a lot of heat and they can give off a lot of heat. Uh, and so they act as a, as a sort of thermostat for the earth. Uh, that keeps the earth from getting way too hot or way too cold. So within Southern California, there, there's three different types of, of ocean biomes I want to talk about. Right, so the first one I want to talk about are estuaries. So estuaries are where rivers meet the ocean. Uh, and so these places are characterized by a mix of fresh water and salt water. Uh, and that's what you see here in the port of Long Beach. Right, so this is all the, the port of Long Beach, right? So here are all the cranes that are moving, you know, you know stuff around, moving uh, uh, containers off and on uh, ships. Uh, and this bay is known as San Pedro Bay, right? So like, this is like the Queen Mary over here. Uh, if you've ever been to the LA, to the, to, the, um, to the Long Beach Aquarium, that's up here. And so here's the, the LA River and here's San Pedro Bay. So what you see here is a mix of fresh and salt water. So essentially all the things that live in here, the very key thing that they need to be able to deal with is, is they need to deal with both being in fresh water and being in salt water. So you find a lot of things living in these areas that, that are tolerant of both conditions. Uh, intertidal zones are another area, another SoCal biome that, that you can find, another SoCal ocean biome. Uh, and, and what characterizes these areas uh, is that they are partially oceanic and partially terrestrial. Uh, and why that is, is because of the tides, right? So probably a lot of you, you know, are familiar with the fact that, that ocean water will kind of go up and come down and go up and come down, you know, over and over again each day. Uh, and the reason why that is, is because of the moon, right? So the moon pulls on our ocean water and it causes, you know, it causes tides to go up and then the tide to go back down. Uh, and so what you see here uh, in, in Leo Carrillo State Beach, you know, which is in kind of the western part of, of L.A. County, uh, is you see all these rocks that are exposed right now. So this was a picture that I was taking during low tide uh, when the water is out a long ways. But if you were to look at the same beach six hours later, the water would be up here. And now all of these dark rocks would be covered up by water. So any of the things that live in and amongst these, these, these dark rocks, uh, they are all intertidal things. So they live in the area between the tides, between the high tide and the low tide. Uh, and so what you see here are marine organisms such as these mussels and sea stars and algae uh, that are able to tolerate air, right? So they are, are able to tolerate both being in the ocean and being in the air. So that is the, the really important adaptation that you have to have in order to live in that area.
Finally, one last so SoCal ocean biome I wanted to talk about are kelp forests. Uh, so this is these are by far the maybe the most special of the, the oceanic biomes that we have in Southern California, uh, at least from the standpoint that there's a, a huge amount of diversity of things that live in and amongst kelp. So kelp are, are protists, uh, and they are photosynthetic protists. Uh, specifically, they are what are known as algae. So we, when we talked about eukaryotes, we talked about the, the protists and about how they are the, the simplest types of eukaryotes, right? So kelp are, are like very, very simple, you know, types of plants is a, is a way you can think about them. Uh, and so all these brown things going up towards the surface, those are kelp. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of things that live in and amongst uh, that kelp. So kelp are only found in very cold uh, waters near coastlines. Uh, such as what you find here in Southern California. So all the places that are green uh, are places where you find kelp. So you see it's really mostly places that are that are far away from the equator. Uh, and kelp forests have uh, a lot of similarities to uh, to, to actual uh, forests. So for one for one thing, uh, they have a lot of shelter hidden inside of them. Right. So in and amongst the various types of kelps that, that you find, you know, there's a lot of places where living things can hide. Uh, and also like forests, uh, kelp forests provide a lot of vertical structure. Right. So kelps can be quite long. Right. So giant kelps can reach like 150 feet long. Uh, bullwhip kelps, which is what I'm holding here in this picture, they can be something like 50 feet long. Right. So kelps can get pretty long. Uh, and they extend from the sea floor all the way up to the surface, providing a sort of vertical structure that is that is not so different from an actual forest. So within a kelp forest, you know, in a lot of ways, it looks like an actual forest. But instead of having trees, you have kelp. And instead of having birds flying around above you, you have fish that are swimming around above you. Uh, and kelp forests have, uh, with all that shelter, they have a lot of things that live inside of them. Uh, and each of those things carry out very, very important roles. Uh, one particular thing that I want to talk about that carries out an important role are sea otters. So sea otters are often referred to as the guardians of the kelp forest. Uh, and why they are known as that uh, is because they eat one really crucial thing, right? Uh, they eat various types of invertebrates, so things that don't have backbones, and they love to eat sea urchins. Sea urchins love to eat kelp. So if you don't have enough sea otters to eat the sea urchins, then what the urchins do is they destroy the kelp forest and then all of these things go away. But when you do have sea otters in an area, they eat those sea urchins uh, and they are able to then control the abundance of sea urchins, which allow the kelp forest to thrive. Right. So without sea otters, you, you oftentimes will lose the kelp forest because the urchins will take over and just eat up all of the, the kelp. So sea otters, in addition to being incredibly cute, they are also uh, they also play really, really important roles uh, in kelp forests. OK, so lastly, we'll talk about terrestrial biomes. Right. So we'll talk about the, the biomes that you find actually on land. Uh, and so this is showing a global map of where you find those various types of biomes. So, for instance, uh, these kind of like uh, olive colored, these kind of like, well, kind of like tan color, that is where you find temperate grasslands. So like in the middle parts of the United States, lots of grassland. You know, in the in the central parts of Asia, you find lots of grassland. Uh, these kind of sandy colored things are where you find desert. Right, so like the northern part of Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, parts of Australia, and then here in, in the southwest, you know, you find lots of desert. So you can see that, that all of these different types of biomes, whether it's tropical forests or savanna or desert or chaparral, you know, they occur in specific places uh, on the, you know, on the, on the planet. And so let's talk about why that is. Uh, so a lot of why that is, is that is, has to do with the, the mean temperature and the mean precipitation, right? So we, we looked at that map of, of frogs, or I'm sorry, of amphibians in general, uh, and we learned that frogs and amphibians, they need a lot of rainfall and they need warm temperatures. And so different terrestrial biomes, they will need certain levels of precipitation and certain types of temperature. So for instance, tropical forests, 
right? If you look on this graph here, the tropical forests are up here. So they need warm temperatures, right? So average mean temperatures of say 22 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about like maybe 80 or so degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so 22, uh, sorry, 22 Celsius, which is like 80 or so Fahrenheit. So they need warm conditions uh, and they need lots of precipitation. So at least 200 uh, centimeters of, of annual precipitation, which is 200, that's that's uh, that's a little bit under six feet of, of precipitation, right? So, or, I'm sorry, that's a little bit more than, than six feet of precipitation, right? So that's a lot of rainfall. So you find lots of rainfall and warm temperatures there. Uh, in contrast, deserts, you know, are here on the graph. So here you find, you know, relatively warm temperatures, uh, but you find very little rainfall. So say less than like, say less than 40 centimeters of rainfall per year, uh, which is about like 17 or 18 inches of rainfall. So deserts, you know, are down here on the graph, very, very little rainfall, but relatively warm temperatures. Uh, although deserts can also be pretty cold. Uh, whereas tropical forests are only in, in, uh, in very wet, very, very warm places. So let's talk a little bit about why it is that there are places that are warm and places that are cold. So a lot of why that is has to do with the, the angle uh, of the earth where you are. So if you are at the equator, the sun strikes the earth there at a much more direct angle. Essentially, the more direct the earth strikes, the more concentrated the sunlight is. You know, like think, think, for instance, if you had, you know, like a band of sunlight coming in, if it strikes the earth directly at the equator, uh, that band of sunlight hits a small area. Whereas if that light, if that band of light is coming in somewhere, you know, really in the far north or the far south, you know, the, the total area that it hits is much wider, meaning that that sunlight isn't quite as concentrated. Right, so the, the, the further north you go, uh, the less concentrated the sunlight is. And the further south you go, the less concentrated the, the sunlight is. Uh, so so the, the angle that the sun comes in has a really big effect on just how warm the climate is gonna be in that area. Uh, I think a lot of you also know that where you are on the earth then also has an effect on how often you see the sun, right? So if you are at the equator, you see the sun for 12 hours at, during the day, and then you don't have the sun for 12 hours at night. And that's you know, pretty much constant you know, throughout the summer and the winter time. You always have about 12 hours of, of day length. Whereas if you're in the far north, like say you're in like the far north parts of like Russia, uh, if you're up there, you know, during the summertime, you might have say 20 hours of, of daylight. But in the wintertime, you have maybe no hours of daylight. So where you are on the planet also affects on how often you, you see the sun. So how often you see the sun and how directly the sun hits you has a big effect on, on climate. Uh, and, the, and, where, and, and, and so that then also has an effect on uh, the amount of moisture in areas. So you tend to find a lot of moisture around the, the tropics, around the equator, uh, because, you have, uh, because you have land there that it gets really, really hot. Uh, and what essentially happens is when you warm up land, uh, you're warming up the air that is above that land. Uh, and what happens to, to hot air? It goes up, so it rises into the atmosphere. Right? You've probably all heard of a hot air balloon, but probably none of you heard of a cold air balloon. And the reason why you haven't heard of a cold air balloon is because they don't exist, because cold air doesn't rise. Uh, if someone ever, ever, you know, invites you to go on a cold air balloon ride, you just spit right in their eye because they're, they're, they're having, they're, they're making a joke uh, because it's not such a thing as that. Hot air rises, cold air doesn't. So hot air around the equator will rise up into the atmosphere. And when it does, it takes moisture with it, right? So there's, it takes water vapor with it up into the atmosphere. Uh, when it gets up into the atmosphere, it cools off because the atmosphere is cold up there. Uh, and what happens to water vapor when you cool it off? It condenses. It goes from being in a, in a gas state into being in a water state. Uh, you have maybe noticed that uh, with, say, a glass of water, right? So when you pour a glass of water, if that water is really cold, it cools off the glass. And the air that is around that glass 
uh, it will all the water that is that is in that air that's in a gas state will turn into a liquid and you end up with liquid sticking to the outside of your glass because uh, cold air has condensed and now that water has gone from being a gas state to being in a uh, to being in a, uh, a liquid state and so you have a lot of that around the equator right so you have a lot of air rising and a lot of rainfall as as a result of, of that so the equator tends to be pretty pretty wet so around the tropics pretty wet so a couple of things that i wanted to talk about that can affect the climate uh, is bodies of water and landforms so bodies of water will have a big effect uh, on temperature and on precipitation so for instance uh, right now as i speak would you bet would you guess that the temperature is warmer out in santa monica uh, or in or in the valley Right, so most of you are thinking, you know, okay, it's probably warmer in the valley. And most likely you're right. Uh, because in general, the air temperature tends to be colder out towards the coast. And that's because the ocean is cold, right? So big bodies of water like the Pacific Ocean, that can affect the climate of local areas. Uh, Landforms such, such as mountain ranges, they can do the same. They can also have a big effect uh, on the climate. So, so consider, you know, consider California, for instance. Uh, in California, we have two ranges of mountains, right? So we have a coastal, you know, mountain range, and we have a Sierra Nevada mountain range. Uh, and around those mountain ranges, you tend to have a lot of precipitation. Uh, and in the valleys between those mountain ranges, you have less precipitation. Uh, and that's what you see when you look at a total map of, of California. Right. So red uh, and yellow and orange is is very little rainfall, whereas blue and green is more rainfall. So you see kind of like along the coast, we have rainfall in the Central Valley, very, very little rainfall. Uh, and then in the Sierras, a lot of rainfall. Uh, and the reason for that is that as air blows in off of the Pacific, uh, it goes up the coastal ranges. Uh, and so it gets forced into the upper parts of the atmosphere. Uh, when that air goes into the upper parts of the atmosphere, we have condensation, kind of like I was talking about before, right? So when air goes up, uh, the water vapor that is in that air condenses and makes rain. So you have a lot of rain on the coastal range, right? So all along here, like along, say, like Big Sur, you know, you have lots and lots of rainfall, like through Big Sur and Monterey and in, in, in San Francisco, lots and lots of rainfall there because of the coastal range. Then you go past the coastal range and that air goes back down into lower uh, uh, altitudes where it's warmer, so it's not gonna rain. So in like the Central Valley, for instance, super, super dry uh, because there's the, that air is, in, is closer to the, the, the ground where it's, where it's warm and, and it's not gonna have rainfall. Then that air gets pushed up again once more as it goes up the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, and so it goes into even higher uh, altitudes uh, where again it condenses and you have rainfall, you know, going down into the Sierras. So all along the Sierras, you know, lots and lots of precipitation in the form of snow in the winter and rainfall in the summertime. And then you get past that and you go out into the desert, right? So now we're going into like into like the Mojave Desert uh, or the, like the Sonoran Desert down here, like out into Nevada too. Uh, and now you see very very little rainfall because all the moisture that had been in this air has now been dumped on the coastal range in the Sierra Nevadas. So now there's no more you know, water left in that air and you end up with, with very, very dry deserts uh, out here. Right, so the reason why Nevada is mostly a desert is because of us, uh, because of California, right? So we get all the rainfall along the coastal range and all along the Sierra Nevadas. So by the time that moist air gets to Nevada, it's pretty much dry. It doesn't have any, any water moisture left. So mountain ranges have a big effect on climate, right? If you if you live in this part of California right here, you deal with a lot of precipitation. If you lived in this part of the California, you would deal with very, very little precipitation. Uh, finally, climate, uh, finally, altitude has a big effect on, on climate, right? So that the higher up you go in altitude, the colder it gets, which of course is gonna have a big effect on the type of things that you find living there and the types of species that you find living there, right? So for instance, in the, in the, the base of the, the valley, you know, it's kind of between like desert and desert grassland, 
if you go further up into the mountains, then you get into oak woodlands, then you get into pine woodlands, and finally you get into spruce forests. So just north of LA in the, the Los Angeles uh, uh, National Forest or in the San Gabriel Mountains, you can actually find really, really big trees there. Uh, you just have to go, you know, up in altitude. You have to go up to like eight or nine or 10,000 feet altitude, you know, which is actually only just uh, just like a maybe one and a half hour drive from from Los Angeles, uh, depending on traffic, of course. So the higher up you go, you, you go through different types of, of plants. OK, so let's talk about uh, we're going to talk about three different major SoCal terrestrial biomes. Uh, so first of all, we've got deserts, right? So these are, of course, the driest of all the biomes. These are areas where there's, you know, fewer than, than 12 inches of rain per year. Uh, even though we, we tend to think of deserts as being very hot, deserts can also be cold. Uh, so for instance, you know, this, this picture is, is a picture I took in, in the Badlands in, uh, in South Dakota. Uh, so this is an area where it's very, very hot in the summer and very, very cold in the wintertime. Uh, and you find that in the deserts of Southern California as well. So like out in Joshua Tree, where I took this picture, you know, during the summertime, it can be, you know, excruciatingly hot. And then in the wintertime, it can be really cold. So so cold that it actually snows. And so the, the sort of adaptations that, that desert organisms have, uh, it's pretty obvious it all has to do with water, right? So Joshua trees are really good at getting water out of the ground, are really good at storing water. Same with cacti, you know, cacti are great at getting water out of the ground and really good at storing water, right? So desert organisms have to be really good at managing their water. Uh, we also see a lot of chaparral uh, in SoCal, uh, uh, you know, a lot of it around around Los Angeles. Uh, and chaparral areas are, are result, they result from having cool oceans uh, that are nearby really warm land. Uh, and that's kind of what you have here, right? So we have a relatively cool ocean, you know, off our coast, uh, and we have relatively warm land, you know, just nearby. Uh, and so what that produces is mild winters with, with you know, some rain, not a huge amount of rain, but some rain, uh, and then super hot, super dry summers. Uh, and so a perfect example of this is the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, so, or, or like Griffith Park, for instance. So imagine Griffith Park or the Santa Monica Mountains, or, or if you haven't spent much time in either of those, you know, think of what it looks like on the 405 as you're driving south from the valley down towards Santa Monica, right? So that area on either side of the 405, that is Chaparral. Uh, and what you find is a lot of shrubs and a lot of trees that are really well adapted for hot summers uh, and really well adapted to fire. Right, so the, all the things that you see living in those areas uh, can grow up from their roots after they burn. Right, so a lot of those plants, they can be burned completely to the ground. There's nothing left of them above ground, but they can grow up just from their roots. Uh, and a lot of the trees that you find in those areas are, are adapted to fire. So very recently, uh, I went for a hike out in the Santa Monica Mountains, uh, and I hiked through an area where the, where the Woolsey fire occurred uh, in, in, uh, in 2019. Uh, or maybe that was 2018. In, in one of those two years, there was a there was a big fire, uh, and and I walked past trees that had been completely charred. Like the outside of them is is super black because it's it's like charcoal, but the trees are still alive and they already had leaves out that were that were growing and and photosynthesizing. So the the plants that can live in chaparral areas are really pretty remarkable in that they can deal with with fire really really well. Uh, in case you haven't spent much time in the Santa Monica Mountains, this is what it will look like more in the wintertime when it's when it's rainy. Then in the summertime, it looks more kind of yellowish brownish uh, as uh, as as you get into the part of the year when there's when there's very little rainfall. Okay, finally, we have some coniferous forests in the in the upper reaches of of like uh, the San Gabriel Mountains or the or the Los Angeles National Forest. So this is actually, believe it or not, I took this picture just like an hour and a half from Los Angeles. Uh, so in, you know, so in this area, you, you have huge uh, uh, coniferous trees. So you have big gymnosperms. So as a reminder, gymnosperms are, are the types of plants that have a vascular system and have seeds, uh, but they don't have fruits and they don't have flowers like an angiosperm. In uh, coniferous forests are, are dominated by these by these conifers. And why they do so well there 
uh, is that conifers tend to have needles. So think of like a pine tree or think of like, you know, or, or if you celebrate, celebrate Christmas, think of like a typical Christmas tree, right? So those, um, so those, those plants, because they have needles, they can deal with heavy snow being on top of them, right? So they can deal with snow on top of their needles. Whereas a plant with a broad leaf is not going to be able to deal with snow on top of its leaves because the, the snow would rip out all of the leaves. So they're really good at dealing with snow and they're really good at dealing with, with losing water in the, in the, or preventing the loss of water in the summertime because needles are really good at keeping water in. So that's why you tend to find conifers in, in the high parts of the, of the Santa Mon of the Los Angeles National Forest. Because up there it snows on them in the wintertime and then it's super dry in the summertime. But they can deal with both of those conditions. Okay, so that's all I have to tell you about, uh, about the kind of intro to ecology and about the biomes. Uh, so in the next chapter, we're going to talk about population ecology.